Welcome to the Applied Clinical Trials Podcast, Next Generation Flow Cytometry, Significant Developments, Trends, and Approaches. This podcast is brought to you by Q Squared Solutions, a leading global clinical trial laboratory services provider. To find out more, please go to q2labsolutions.com. And now, here's your host for this podcast, the contributing editor for Applied Clinical Trials, Anna Zvolinsky. Hello, everyone. This is Anna Zvolinsky, the contributing editor for Applied Clinical Trials, and I'm here with Mark Edinger, the Scientific Affairs Director of Flow Cytometry at Q Squared Solutions. Thank you for being here today, Mark. Good to be here. Okay, first, could you give us a brief overview of your experience in flow cytometry? Yes, I first started in flow cytometry in uh, 1978. Um, well, at the Cleveland Clinic, I worked uh, there 21 years uh, on um, building uh, clinical and research flow cytometry labs. Also, I worked as a consultant for Becton Dickinson during that period of time. Uh, in 1998, I joined Becton Dickinson and worked there for 14 years in R&D and supported global and national accounts as well. And then joined uh, what was then Quintiles in 2012, which is now Q-Squared Solutions. Uh, and, um, and, and that's um, about 40 years of flow cytometry experience. Okay, that's great. And can you provide an overview of the current flow cytometry practice and the value of next generation flow cytometry? Because what are the most significant technological developments that underpin next generation flow cytometry? The flow cytometry has gone through a long development uh, and has, has been mirrored by other technologies, including the development of monoclonal antibodies, uh, computer technology, um, um, and, uh, and digital technology overall, right? The digitization of the, of the process. Um, and it's benefited from all of those uh, and, 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 and involved those, built those into the processes over time. Right now, it's, and, and there's been many times when people said, oh, flow has reached its maximum. It's not going to be, uh, have the utility it had in the past. And it seems to only gain greater utility over time. Right now, the focus is in immuno-oncology, uh, and the, the use of flow cytometry is really central to the, develop, to the, the development of the new anti-cancer and immunotherapies that are currently being developed by the pharmaceutical and biotech uh, industries in, you know, around the world. And we're, we're very deeply involved in that testing, and it's central to uh, those studies and to patient outcomes. Okay, and so why would drug developers choose next-generation flow cytometry, and what are the most common applications that they choose? It's really the best way to monitor the immune response and the micro, tumor microenvironment. Um, years ago, we only had one-color readouts. They went to two-color readouts, and then there was three, and then four. And only recently, and this is in the last, um, last year or two, there's been two developments um, where that have really come to the forefront, and that's mass uh, spec or, or mass flow cytometry, which is called Cytol, which allowed uh, uh, the um, co-end investigation of multiple markers out of a single sample. And so, instead of only looking at maybe two analytes or three analytes, we could look upwards of 40 or more. Uh, fluorescence technology is the other way that flow cytometry is executed, and that. That is slow to catch up, but in the last year and a half, there's been the release of new instrumentation and new methodologies actually taken from the telecommunications industry, something called coarse wave, wavelength division multiplexing, um, spectral unmixing, uh, that allows us to look at upwards of 43 different analytes on, on, on say, a five-laser system. The other thing that's really happened is, you know, flow cytometry at the beginning was very primitive and very and cost prohibitive. For instance, a laser on the original machines, even back in the 70s, would cost upwards of over $100,000 for a single laser. Um, and we really didn't have the floor crumbs and the things we needed to execute. Now we have lots of bright new floor crumbs. Lasers have become very cheap. Computing power has become really inexpensive. Um, and the ability to build a flow cytometer is exquisitely powerful uh, for a reasonable amount of money, um, maybe one tenth the cost of the original flow cytometers in, 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 in money, translated in, into money today for inflation. Um, it's really been made the technology much more powerful, much more affordable, so that almost every researcher and investigator has access to this technology now. Um, and it's been automated and made user-friendly to the point where people can derive useful results without a lot of experience. So as the technology's matured, it's come into more and more hands and, and actually at the same time become more powerful, which is a, 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 an exquisite combination of outcomes. 
Okay, and are there any common misconceptions about next-generation flow cytometry? Yes. I think one of the things that's, that's happening, and I see this, is we're moving towards um, looking further down the road than the actual data. And what I'm saying is there's a lot of new algorithms that are being uh, used. There's Tisney, Bisney, Spade, Citrus, ways of looking at complex data sets in simplistic displays, ostensibly and visually uh, simplistic displays that uh, people derive results from or, or find new combinations, new markers that they hadn't discovered before. But if you look at the underlying data, sometimes the resolution, at least from my eye, isn't what it needs to be. And I think uh, we, we shouldn't get too far away at looking at the actual results of for individual markers in flow cytometry and seeing how they perform in terms of resolution. Um, and make sure that uh, that when we're looking at these complex algorithms where we're doing uh, sophisticated data analysis, that we don't lose sight of the underlying quality of the data uh, in those analyses. I think that's uh, one of the greatest weaknesses. The other weakness is is that now that the, the instruments are so easy to use, so powerful, and we can get such complex results from them, that the operators don't lose track of the fundamentals. So the full cytometer produces the results, but everything up to that point uh, the processing of the samples, the handling of the samples, the design of the panels, all of that really becomes even more critical. And I don't think a lot of people pay enough attention to that. Um, and that's one of the things that we pay particular attention to at Q-squared is making sure that the entire process is, is uh, clearly defined. All the assays are well validated from from the standpoint of stability and precision, making sure that uh, that we've adequately uh, developed an assay in, uh, in terms of individual analyte resolution, so that we're confident when we go to the new, more complex uh, algorithms for analysis that indeed the data that underpins them is solid. Okay, how is Q squared solutions using next generation flow cytometry to advance customer uh, study needs? So we first started by globally standardizing all our instruments, and we went to a, to a greater extent than most other laboratories. Most laboratories use a bead, and beads are, are great because they're inexpensive. You can make them perform things that cells themselves can't or are more difficult to get the, to use a cell for. Uh, so a bead is a good surrogate for a cell in some instances. Uh, when it comes to standardizing instruments, it turns out that you're actually better with fluorochrome-specific beads rather than a, a bead that's a surrogate that has multiple um, compounds in it that fluoresce across maybe 300 to 800 nanometers. Um, and so what we've done is we've developed, along with a, a, a provider who we have these custom manufactured by, um, uh, fluorescence control beads so that we can set targets across all, all the, the globe. We have 40 instruments globally in our eight different global laboratories. And to make sure that we're able to produce the exact same result from any one of those machines was a goal of ours. Um, and so we've used the software and the machines that we buy and we've, we've taken the instrument characterization software that's available in them and used them to the, to the extent that allows us to uh, create a predicate instrument using all of the characterization data that's derived from each of these machines and then uh, optimize the dynamic range of all the detectors, set targets with these beads, and then use these targets to completely standardize the machines globally. This is extremely important when you're working in a clinical trial space with multiple instruments across multiple sites, that you make sure that the instruments really are performing in an equivalent manner. We also use that data to monitor instruments from a central point in Edinburgh, Scotland, on a daily basis to make sure that they're all performing correctly. Um, well, the flow cytometer, unless you actually characterize it with beads or some particle at the beginning of every day, you really don't know how well it's operating. It really becomes a black box. So the transparency we get from using that characterization data both to maintain the operation of the machines and to standardize them has really been critical to, to our operation. We've also done other things that make it more reliable. So we use a dedicated analysts. Uh, we use uh, senior data analysts for more complex assays to limit the amount of variability and subjectivity that's applied in data analysis. That's a critical juncture as well. And then the usual things of having globally harmonized SOPs, we gener generate uh, in what we determine to be the appropriate QC material, a reference range for every assay. And a control is run at the beginning of every assay. If there's multiple samples, there's one run at the end. And if, unless the QC passes according to the ranges we determine for each individual assay, the assay is either repeated, uh, it must be repeated until the QC passes. So we're very strict about how we operate. 
We're very tightly standardized and controlled globally, and that's really been the key to our success. Okay, so, so what are best practices to keep in mind? Well, we talked about some of them. So standardization is one of them. I think having a dedicated laboratory as we do, we have the translational science laboratory that does all of the assay development. And so we have scientists in those laboratories whose only focus is developing assays. And uh, we, 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 we actually perform a lot of discovery as part of that process. And we keep a share point where we do things like clone comparisons, conjugate comparisons, all the learnings that we've taken over time from validating upwards of now 500 different assays in the last five years. Um, we take all of that and we, we build that in every day and use that experience to get better and better at what we do. Um, we also are very collaborative. So flow cytometry has maybe been divided into three different areas, the translational science laboratory, which does assay development science, which I'm part of. I have developed the overall workflow strategy, strategy for flow cytometry, write the SOPs, and then global operations under global cytometry that foresees day-to-day -day operations on a global basis. I think we've organized in a way that allows us to really be efficient and to uh, make sure the best practices we institute are maintained. Um, so there's proficiency testing of operators, there's the qualification of machines for a particular assay. Um, we're building an automation wherever possible to remove variability of performance of individual operators. We control lots on a global basis through a central person in, uh, in Edinburgh. So we're looking at all the things we can do can, to, can, to limit variability, enhance reliability, um, and we've instituted those in best practices through our SOPs. Um, and so they, they sort of become immutable because if you follow the process, um, it's, really, it, you know, it, it's really difficult to have a problem. For instance, if you look at any of our SOPs, we've designed our workflows in such a way that the, the last 10 instructions of every SOP are exactly the same. And all the critical setup has been moved to uh, sequestered to, to a few uh, technologists in each of the laboratories who execute setup, uh, compensation, uh, standardization. All those things are controlled, um, done by a, a small group of experts. And then the, the, the assay technologists who run the assays really only have to be uh, really competent at staining the parts that aren't automated. And then the, the actual running of the assay is the same on every one of them so that there's less chance for uh, mistakes and error. Okay, and just, just lastly, how do you see next generation flow cytometry changing in the next five, ten years? And how do you think those changes affect the future of clinical trials and drug development? So I think we're, we're going to be uh, obtaining so much more value from the data. There's so much more correlative data when you can run everything in a single tube or a single well of a plate. So up until now, we've had to merge tubes across uh, multiple uh, data across multiple tubes to obtain uh, some information. Never as good as correlative analysis. It also limits the amount of blood we have to obtain for a given sample for a given test. And and really, you know, uh, this is a central focus of ours is to limit the blood volumes we're requesting for testing. And and and, and this is really in the patient interest. That will benefit the patient and, and actually facilitate clinical trials that may not have been possible up till now because of the blood volumes that had previously been uh, required. I think the new algorithms that are coming into place are, there are laying the groundwork for a whole new realm of discovery that wasn't possible before. I think the, the, the being able to see markers that, that hadn't been previously associated or discover lineages or populations or functionality that hadn't been recognized before simply because we have these data sets now and we have better ways of analyzing them uh, more rapidly and more thoroughly, I think that's going to drive whole new, uh, a whole new realm of discovery and, and speed up discovery overall. I wish I had another 40 years to go because <laughs> I think in the next 40 years it's just going to be amazing, maybe even in the next 10, because as, uh, over time, over the 40 years I've been doing this, the, 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 the pace of development has only accelerated and continues to accelerate. Um, and I think uh, flow cytometry, uh, especially next generation flow cytometry, will become a, is a central tool and become even more a central tool uh, in uh, in discovery. And I, and I'm, I'm I'm thrilled to see that because I've invested a life a life's work in it. Thank you for that informative overview, Mark. We truly appreciate you being here today. This has been Anna Zvolinsky, the contributing editor for Applied Clinical Trials. Thanks to all for listening. You've been listening to the Applied Clinical Trials podcast, Next Generation Flow Cytometry, Significant Developments, Trends, and Approaches. 
This podcast was brought to you by Q Squared Solutions, a leading global clinical trial laboratory services provider. To find out more, please go to q2labsolutions.com.